Okay, so I think we'll, we'll begin. Um, thank you all for coming. I am very happy, honored uh, to welcome uh, Alex and all the rest of us here at SOS this evening, and um, of course to celebrate the publication of Dr. Alexandra Green's new monograph, uh, Buddhist Visual Cultures, Rhetoric and Narrative in Late Burmese Wall Paintings which was published with um, Hong Kong University Press. The book, you'll be hearing a lot more about it, uh, but in short, I can say it is a unique and comprehensive study of Burmese wall paintings from the late 17th to the early 19th centuries uh, in the central region of Burma. It's also a very broad-ranging examination of relations between image and space, image and text, and uh, Burmese Buddhist devotional practices, um, and lots of other things that you'll be hearing about. I think that uh, Alex needs very little introduction uh, in an event run by the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. She's well known in Southeast Asian art circles, um, but I will give you some of the basics. After completing her PhD here at SOAS, she pursued uh, what has become quite an illustrious curatorial career landing uh, her most recently at our doorstep uh, mm -hmm. down the street at the British Museum, where she is currently Henry Ginsburg Curator for Southeast Asia. She has a very long list of publications, um, including a series of edited volumes, Burma Art and Archaeology, <coughs> co-edited with Richard Blurton, uh, Eclectic Collecting, Art from <coughs> Burma in the Denison Museum, and Rethinking Visual Narratives from Asia, Intercultural and Comparative Perspectives. So you can see the themes building up to uh, the monograph that we'll be discussing this evening. Uh, Alex has also curated two exhibitions at the British, Mu British Museum, the first being Pilgrims, Healers and Wizards, Buddhism and Religious Practices in Burma and Thailand. That was in 2014. And then in 2016, Shadow Puppet Theater from Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand. She's currently working on a history of Southeast Asia seen through the objects um, in the British Museum collection. Also, a study of relations between word and image in Burmese popular posters. And she's currently also developing an exhibition on raffles, which will open at the ACM, I believe, uh, in January 2019 in Singapore. And then we'll continue uh, again to our doorstep uh, in September 2019. So. Um, uh, a busy colleague indeed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very honored to welcome three other colleagues who will act as respondents to Alex's book, book this evening. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Sarah Shaw. She's a specialist of Pali literature, a member of Wolfson College and the Faculty of Oriental Studies at Oxford, where she's also a fellow at the Center of Buddhist Studies. Uh, Sarah has published extensively on Buddhist narrative and image and text, including a 2006 book entitled Jataka Stories, Birth Stories of the Bodhisattva, a 2013 co-authored volume, Illuminating the Life of the Buddha, an 18th century Siamese chanting manual with the Bodleian, and a 2015 co-authored volume with Silkworm Books, The Ten Great Birth Stories of the Buddha. Um, after Sarah's response, we'll move on to Dr. John Clark, um, who is a specialist in the art and culture of the Himalayas and of Southeast Asia. He is currently curator of Himalayan and Southeast Asian art at the V&A. He has published widely on the art of both regions um, with various publications I won't go through in great detail. Um, I also want to say that he acted as lead curator for the Robert N. Ho Family Foundation Galleries of Buddhist Art, um, which opened at the V&A in 2017. Uh, we'll finish this evening with uh, my colleague, Professor Shane McCausland. He's a historian of visual arts and material culture with a particular focus on the painting and, and calligraphy produced in dynastic China. Um, he also curates Chinese contemporary art. And his most recent monograph, I believe, is the 2014 The Mongol Century, Visual Cultures of Yuan China with reaction books. And I believe Shane is currently working on a book entitled The Art of the Chinese Picture Scroll, text, image, medium, which will also appear with reaction books. So that's who you have uh, on your plate this evening. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. And we will open with, just to give you a sense of the, the order of affairs, we'll open with Alex speaking a bit on her book, then we'll move through our speakers. 
Alex will then have the, um, the opportunity to, to uh, enter into the conversation on her book with them, and then we'll open it up to, to you guys, to the audience. So that's where we are. So thank you, Alex. So thank you to you, Ashley, and also to the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS. I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to launch my book, which is it's very exciting. So, and, and also I want to say thank you to Shane and John and Sarah for agreeing to, to, to put out the effort to read the book and then write something <laughs> about it. Um, and I also, of course, want to thank Hong Kong University Press for publishing it. And then last but not least, there have been just so many people who've helped me with the book over the years, um, some, of, uh, some of whom are in this room. So I just would like to say thank you to, to all of them and you as well. <clears throat> Um, so my book is basically about narratives. Um, I was very curious to have an understanding of what they what they looked like in 18th century Burma. They're 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 lovely. They're captivating. As you well, it's not very. And we could lower the blind here a bit more. Um, um, but also, thanks. Thanks. Well, that's a bit better. So anyway, so my book's about narratives. So what they look like in 18th century Burma, what their purposes were, um, how they achieved them, you know, and their possible forms of reception. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but in, in addition to presenting this material, which is relatively unknown, um, even in Burma, um, I. So I wanted to go beyond that. I wanted to look at, um, I wanted to engage with narrative theory. And I'm, I'm really seeking ways to understand how visual narratives work on their own terms. I think so much of visual narrative literature in the past that I write has been very much about how it, visuals relate to text. And I really want to see how visuals actually stand on, on their own. So what I argue in this book, the sort of the overarching argument is that space and location are really essential components of visual narratives. Um, whether your narrative is on a fan, whether it's on a music box, whether it's in a wall painting, whether it's in a scroll painting, um, you know, how is it actually presented? Um, and I, that, I think, is, is an essential component, um, as I said. And um, time has been the, 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 the aspect that's been considered a defining characteristic. And this, I think, is what most strongly links visual narratives to textual narratives. And so in a sense, we need to pull that apart in order to um, get to the heart of what visual narratives do. And that's not arguing that time is not important. I just feel that it's sort of one component. It's not the defining um, uh, characteristic. Um, and so, Basically, this is, examined, this is necessitated re-examination of word and image relationships. And I mean, it's a topic, and I'll end up with an image of a project that I'm working on right now. Um, it's basically a topic that I'm still engaged with. So just to show you a little bit of what the wall paintings um, look like um, and to where they are located. So that's a, um, an image, obviously, of, of the central part of, of Burma, and you can see the but most of the sites are around the confluence of the Chindwin River and the Irrawaddy River. So if you draw sort of a circle around that Y shape, um, that's the area where you get most of these uh, wall paintings. There are a few um, images outside of that region, but um, they tend not to be this particular late 17th to early 19th century tradition. And um, part of the reason you get them located in this region is that um, the sites were part of a secondary um, uh, religious network, so um, not the religious networks um, developed entirely by the court, but you get these secondary centers outside um, the, 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 the capital area. Um, the temples tend to be small. Um, they're usually square, um, and um, they're oftentimes, they're mostly donations by individuals or families, so it's not the, the larger buildings that you got at the Vagan period, which were a combination of, of many people contributing. Um, these are small personal um, uh, sites, and they're, as I said, they're all in this central dry zone, which has meant that the, the paintings last longer um, than they would if they were in some of the wetter regions. And then this is what an in, a typical interior looks like. Um, you have a layout uh, usually of um, uh, one, three, or four entrances. Um, most of the uh, temples face east with the Buddha image seated against the west wall. 
And um, the interiors are approximately, I measured the, all the ones that I went to, they're approximately three meters square. So there's really a very standardized size um, for, these, uh, um, for these buildings. And as a donation, um, they would confer um, considerable social status upon um, the family, the individuals and families um, making the offering. Um, and it would help them um, not only achieve status Con, uh, in the contemporary period, but also in future lives, they would um, have a good future rebirth, and eventually they would be reborn in the time of Maitreya, and therefore they would um, become awakened beings as well. Um, what we tend to see is it's a very standardized format. Um, so, sorry, some of the buildings aren't in great condition, but I really like this image of the person coming with a large lacquer container. So what we see in the entrances are um, donors, um, and oftentimes um, the images are very specific. So I don't think they're portraits, but um, they probably do represent the donors to the temple um, um, themselves. You also get hell scenes. You get other scenes associated with um, karma. And of course, then you on the ceiling of entrances, oftentimes you have footprints pointing in towards um, the main Buddha image. And then this, when you get inside, this is um, a very nice layout. So internally, the, the, um, the wall paintings wrap around um, the Buddha image. And as they go round and round, they wend their way up. So it's basically sort of a spiral up, up the temple. And um, the, the material is organized hierarchically. So the, the further from enlightenment you are, the lower down the, the story is. And um, the images at the top are um, are the, the Buddhas of the past. And as I said, the, the standard, the mural arrangements are standardized. Um, and it's, that's not, uh, what I mean when I say standardized is not that every temple is exactly the same, but that they draw on basically uh, a, a core of material um, and, and arrange that material in, in a, a specific type of format. Um, so the topics that you find um, um, are Buddhist biography, and um, of the types of Buddhist biography that you get, um, there's the Buddhas of the past. So you have the 28 Buddhas of the past. And they're important, of course, because of the prophecies um, that they made to Gautama Buddha that he would become a Buddha in the future. Um, you also have um, scenes of the life of the Buddha. And these, these the, uh, the Buddhas of the past are highest up on the walls. Underneath that are uh, images of the life of the Buddha. And these are laid out in cause and effect um, strips with captions. And again, they, they wend their way around the temple walls. Um, and they tend to emphasize, these Life of the Buddha stories tend to emphasize the events um, leading up to the enlightenment of the Buddha. So once the Buddha becomes enlightened, and oftentimes the enlightenment um, itself isn't represented in the wall paintings, um, but is, is represented by the main Buddha image. Um, and occasionally you have scenes, a few scenes after his enlightenment, particularly the seven weeks. But as I said, most of it relates to um, the run up to, to his awakening. And this, of course, and again, I go into this in more detail, this connects to um, literary material from the Shan states and northern Thailand, which was brought into central Burma when the Burmese um, took control of that region in the um, 16th um, and 18th centuries. And then beneath the, um, the lives of the life of the Buddha, you have um, the 10 great Jataka stories, which of course represent the 10 virtues that are necessary for awakening. And um, these are also arranged hierarchically. So the, the first of the 10 um, great Jatakas is lowest down on the floor, and it moves up. So that the, the final one, um, the Visantra Jataka, um, is right below, or even on the same level as the, the life of the Buddha. Um, basically, in focusing upon Buddhist biography, the murals, I argue that the murals make the Buddha present, um, and it provides um, a setting in which um, the practitioners can engage with the Buddha and his community. Everything is set within, um, the lives of the Buddha are all set within contemporary um, um, uh, Burmese dress, hairstyles, architecture, and so it makes it absolutely as if it's happening um, right now. And um, what we also see here are um, uh, vernacular literary developments. So there's a, a push towards translating poly materials into, um, 
um, into Burmese, and we see that in the wall paintings, and we also see this, these em literary embellishments that develop um, during the sort of um, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, we start seeing those also, um, not only in the texts, in the captions, but also in the detail that you find in the paintings themselves. And then on the ceilings, um, above all this biographical material, you usually have um, a, a lotus um, form, um, but this is laid out in such a way that um, it replicates Indian trade textile patterns. And um, basically, uh, to, uh, Indian trade textiles were luxury goods and um, in Burma at the time. And so what we see here is an effort to make um, a visual offering to the Buddha. Um, and also, it very clearly indicates the donor's um, access to such luxury items. So it performs a dual function in both um, honoring the Buddha, but also promoting the, the status of, um, of the donors. Um, so my main, my overarching argument for the book is basically that um, the painted imagery was particularly selected and organized to present coordinated themes and a cohesive program within the temple spaces and that these, these were replicated for more than 100 years. So what we see, we see during this time significant stylistic changes, but actually the format, the scenes selected, and um, uh, the ways in which the stories are represented remain the same. So we, we see quite substantial visual changes, yet the, same, the structure, the structure um, remains largely the same. And so what I, I see is that the imagery has basically shaped by the architectural forms and it's posited in relationship to the sculpture. So all these aspects of the temple um, are, are working together. They form basically a platform to create the Buddha's presence. And I argue that it does this that the architecture with its basic layout of an odd number of entrances into a usually single interior space contains the field of, a field of merit that's created by the Buddhist biography and also by having um, images of, of, of karma and donors uh, and people paying homage in the, in the uh, entrances um, creates a frame for the Buddha's presence. Um, uh, and so basically you have the practitioners can then see themselves as part of, of this community. And so when you, when you enter the temple, the sculpted Buddha image is the focal point. Um, and it's also the focal point, obviously, for devotions that people would um, make in the temple. But because that image, that moment of enlightenment that's represented by the main image is not usually shown um, in the paintings itself, this main image provides closure for the painted narratives. So we see here, again, as I said, all these pieces working, working together. Um, and the, what you have with the biography on the walls wrapping around the image, it's as if the image is, the Buddha is telling these stories, of course, um, presentation, oral presentation of narratives um, was very important um, during the Buddha's lifetime, and oftentimes he taught quite complex concepts through narrative. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the, him explicating the perfection of the, of, of the virtues. And there's also a practice in Northern Thailand whereby um, uh, Buddha images are consecrated by um, the, the monks chanting the life story to the image, the, the Buddha's life story to the image. So I think these images can function in, in a number of, of ways, um, basically as um, the community um, creating the Buddha image here through his, his stories, but then also the Buddha um, responding and, and teaching um, the practitioners. So not all, not all the elements, of course, of the wall paintings are narrative, but I would argue that shown in conjunction with the sculpted focal point, the overly narrative murals, and framing architecture, these patterns um, unite the images into a whole that replicates luxury offerings to the Buddha and emphasizes the narrative of honoring the Buddha. And the imagery as a whole contributes to and reconfirms a worldview about the Buddha and social and economic status that is tautologically reinforced by the biographical material. So what we see when we enter temples um, from this late 17th to early 19th century period is to enter a cohesively articulated and represented Burmese Buddhist world um, to which the devotee belonged by performing ritual activities within the space. Um, but of course, I don't, what I did want to say is that, you know, I, when I was writing this book, it, it had, it morphed over time. I've rewritten it a number of times. And um, one of the things I wanted it to do was for it to sit 
nicely within studies of visual narratives in Asia. I mean, there are quite a number of them. Um, we have Stanley Abe's and Sonia Lee's work um, on Dunhuang. Um, both of them have talked about the roles of architecture, sculpture, and imagery in shaping the meaning of a narrative in actual space. Um, and so that's, that's been a significant factor in, in how I've approached this material. Um, but then also um, Janice Lioshko has worked on Indian narratives from Bodh Gaya. And although in quite a lot of her work she talks about um, images of the Buddha, um, she addresses structure um, uh, as a means of transmitting concepts and practices. And she argues that um, the manner of presentation is part of the intended message. And I think that's um, a, a huge part of my argument. And of course, um, Shane and Sarah have both looked at um, cross-media interactions between textual narratives and the visual arts. And um, what we see in all of these studies is they explore word and image and spatial relationships in expanded and nuanced ways. In other words, they look beyond the limitations of rigid concepts of form and content um, and to come up with um, uh, a real sense of how, how these words and images and space um, all really function um, together. And then um, I feel that I've, I've just completed an article or a draft of an article looking at the representation of word and image in um, the, some Burmese popular posters that we have in the British Museum collection. And um, <clears throat> although you could say this you know, what has this got to do with wall paintings and paintings on temple spaces? I would say that actually it has a, quite a lot to do with it. That what I'm looking at here and what I argue here is that um, we see an amalgamation of visual conventions with the tradition of condensing oral and written texts in, in poly oriented Buddhism. So what we see here is a fully embodied image text. It's neither word nor image. Um, and <coughs> And that this actually has a lot to do with the concept of space because, how do I explain this nicely um, and succinctly? But basically, if we're looking at, um, at understanding how images function uh, in themselves, you have to look at how they function. And I argue that they function in space. And, um, and that in order to get them to images to stand on their own, you have to look at that, um, that aspect of them. So basically, um, I see my work as part of a larger discussion about the relationship between word and image. It's part of the visual turn in academic circles. It's also an acknowledgment of the variety and fluidity of word image relationships. Um, and I pulled up these a um, uh, couple of images because I was reading an article in the Times Literary Supplement yesterday about comics and how um, the, talking about the relationship between words and images in, in, in comics and how graphic novels are really coming into their own. And um, of course, it's been a long-standing tradition um, in manga, and we're actually having a manga exhibition at the British Museum um, next year. Um, but even though it's been a long-standing tradition in Japan, it's only fairly recently that, um, that they've become important and a subject of study elsewhere uh, as well. And I, said, I was thinking that now the images are being given more credence and operating separately from text, they can be explored on their own terms and not only in relationship to verbal and textual structures, which of course brings me back like broken record to the concept of space and how the format of the image is part of the message. So, thank you. Thank you. Extensive citation of primary and secondary sources, 
is careful in its examination of the evidence specific to each context, but most importantly, it's highly appreciative and it, as well as being analytic in its account of this wonderful art. So it, it really creates for us a sense of the location, uh, the background, and um, the whole imaginative world of, of 17th century Burma onwards. And of course, I'm not an art historian, and I need this. When I go to a temple, I can appreciate the art, but I need to be filled in with all the references and the, the background, just to give me some sort of context as to how to understand it. And I was very appreciative of the way the, the book does this. And we have a sense of these people, these merchants and these peasants and whatever, and the workers and royalty and monastics, some educated and some not, who would all be using the temple and find through the narratives there, the Jatakas, um, their own relationship with this um, enclosed space. Because the Jatakas are stories about the past lives of the Bodhisattva, and he aims for an awakening. And he's reborn in many spheres, um, different kinds of animals and humans and gods. And so anybody who goes in to a temple and is enclosed in this space would, would also feel that they could move anywhere in, in this very organized <coughs> cosmological space, that there is a sense that a, a, a wholesome action, an offering, um, gives them an opening to any area of this wonderful world. Um, and as Alexandra says, temples and their contents operate as a whole, with the memorials enfolding the sculpted images in a space designed for personal interactions. So as you walk into this still center of the Buddha, you would be walking through these narratives. Um, I'd just like to talk about two areas, really, which have particularly interested me in this book, amongst many. But one thing I, I one area I particularly wanted to address was um, the dedicated care with which the chanting traditions are examined and explained. And this really is worthy of note, because the uh, oral actual, the way and, and mode and the context for how chants uh, are used has, has often been neglected in, in the Buddhist studies. And um, Alex has examined these very closely. Buddhist practice, ritual, ritual, and education has since the earliest times been perpetuated by chanting. So repetition, rhythm, and the enumeration of lists and elements that repeat and repeat and repeat are the lifeblood of this. These memory devices, uh, such as martikas, root lists, endlessly repetitive suttas, were specifically designed just so that people could remember them uh, and be used they, you find them as ways of using rep repetition and reiteration as a way of um, keeping something in your mind. And I feel this is addressed very well indeed in the book because, of course, any meditation, if you take the Buddha Anasati, the recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, it requires, again, this element of repetition and reiteration and of um, things happening again and again. So I liked the way that Alex explores these chants in, as, as, in a way, complex and highly organized memory systems that you can order space and you can order material through um, this arrangement of, of the chants. Um, and it, the, the, the book includes a great deal of this. And, and also what I really like is, is her suggestion that um, the, the reiteration of emblems and motifs from the textiles also have a kind of, uh, they're like the heartbeat of the temple as you go through, that you, you feel this sense of repetition of very beautiful motifs, which will remind you again and again to, to come back to the presence of the Buddha. And although these temples are filled with uh, protective diagrams, patterns, zodiacal imagery, a cosmology of vast and magnificent scope, this whole imaginaire is, is organized through um, patterns and repetition, and, and I very much like the way Alex has emphasized this. And the second point I'd, I'd like to say is really about the stories, which are the Jatakas. 
and they're completely trans-regional and transcultural, so that anybody from any area around would know the stories, they, they would um, be the same. And it's very interesting looking at uh, Thai depictions of the same stories. Again, the Thais felt that the Jatakas took place in some sort of wonderful present, so that you see the stripes, trousers of Portuguese sailors in, in <laughs> Burmese and in Thai Jatakas. They think Jatakas just happen in, in a kind of present, ongoing present. Um, and I very much like the way this book has uh, examined this sort of Jataka world as a kind of a way of being inclusive and, and as a whole universe really, because the beings are always chatting to each other in these stories, uh, very unusually in, in um, uh, literary cultures of the world. They, they all converse with each other and argue and debate. So this temple is, is a field where these beings can meet, and I very much like the way Alex has shown this. So I think um, other points I think I would like to make is it seems very interdisciplinary to me, and unnecessarily so, and I was very pleased to find that, um, and that it's, it seemed very accessible to you. Um, I think that's, that's all I have to say, except I think it's a wonderful book. <laughs> and uh, I, I, the only time I ever heard a respondent speak about a book, they were very, very rude, <laughs> and, but I couldn't think of anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> so my apologies thank for you. that. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Alex for um, uh, inviting me. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, there's always a danger of repeating some of the same points, but in a way, um, we may be repeating some of the strengths of the book, I think, and that will, that will come out. Um, to say something really obvious, um, that this, this book um, is, is really the first um, well-rounded study of, of a subject which has not hitherto really been um, studied in as much detail, for example, as the earlier paintings that began, that are much um, better known, from, usually from the 12th and 13th century. And Alex brings meticulous and rigorous scholarship to the study of this relatively um, unstudied phenomenon, this efflorescence of painting in the long century, essentially 150 years from the late 17th century to the early 19th century. Um, so this is really the first in-depth study of this vibrant artistic tradition. Um, the, the main um, religious themes have already been given by um, Alex, um, and so I won't, I won't um, you know, labour those points. But these um, scenes include within them all these other details that are so wonderful. The palace, scenes of palace life, depictions of luxurious Indian trade textiles, and just to mention a few, the protective and auspicious diagrams, such as interlinked nagas, the 136 animals that represent the Buddha's past lives as an animal, lotus pools, the Buddha Pada, also the religious and folk figures, the earth goddess, the eight lords of the Arahant cult, Zorgis or alchemists, and their fruit maiden trees, and that is not an exhaustive list. But Alex has critically analysed this interwoven mass of visual imagery. I think in a, in a, a wonderfully cogent, well-rounded, I would say, holistic way, it's really making a similar point to the last speaker, thoroughly um, uh, you know, interdisciplinary, also very sophisticated in the methodological approach. Um, she draws methodologies from a number of disciplines, religious and historical, studies, anthropology, art history, and as um, touched on quite a lot, theories of the meanings of narrative. For this reason, as Janice Lyoshko has remarked, the work goes a long way to um, creating a sort of template that could be used for analyzing other late Buddhist painting traditions. So in what ways does she give this well-rounded picture? Well, in the introduction, she surveys the state and um, distribution of surviving paintings from the Bagan period through to the paintings that she's discussing. She looks at the historical, political, and economic context 
that produced the late paintings, which survive within um, around 160 small temples. Uh, these <coughs> painting programs were the results of a period of economic and population growth in the central region. And she unpicks this nexus of events which led to this upsurge, um, which coincided with increased political stability, centering on the newly re-established capital of Ava. Um, and during this long century, this zone became a major um, center of monasticism. Also critically, this was a time when religious governors and village headmen were establishing more power locally, and some were becoming rich enough to actually commission these temples. As has been discussed, a major facet of this work is um, a detailed analysis of the painting programs themselves, done in a number of ways. Um, the narratives are examined using theories of narratology, and Alex has already spoken about this, um, looking at varied <coughs> interpretations and meanings derived from structure, form, and visual modes. She shows how narrative functions in interlinked religious and secular terms, acting both didactically, storytelling, and as an invitation and an exhortation to generate merit and engage in the Buddhist path for the, um, for, for the onlooker and worshipper. In a certain sense, they also act in an iconic manner. The point, again, that Alex has already made, but I think is worth making again, is that the paintings are looked at as a unified whole, enfolding the main three-dimensional Buddha image at the point of enlightenment in the stories of the previous and past lives, so that the sculptural image was the culmination of the path described by the narrative paintings. And um, as has already been said, this creates a unified field of merit in the interior for the artist, the patron, the worshipper, and in a sense for the, the Buddha presence and the Buddha image itself. The book also looks at this close interaction between narrative religious painting and other popular art forms at the time. In these late paintings, extended narrative storytelling replaces the earlier visual forms of Bagan, where a Jataka is often represented just by a single episode um, from, from a story. And this finds a parallel in 18th century Burma in a move towards um, embellishment of stories and a vernacular retelling in prose or verse of Jataka stories from the Pali scriptures. At this time, long poems were also being written by monks on similar themes, and there was a growth in court and popular theatre performances, and there is even a parallel between the tableau that one finds staged in provincial theatre performances and in the narrative scenes that one finds in the strip paintings. And Alex beautifully brings out these juxtapositions and links between different art forms. For worshippers, the three main themes um, depicted in the paintings merit, protection, and the path to enlightenment connected both the secular and the religious worlds. So it was this connection um, was really cemented together through the driver and instigator, which was the karmic or karmic Buddhism of Southeast Asia. And Alex, again, very um, centrally um, points out the role of karma in, um, in, in, in the production of art and you know, as being the reason for you know, the, the creation of these works. The law of spiritual cause and effect stresses the link between good rebirths and acts of merit such as making offerings and donations. And this, of course, also includes major acts of merit, such as commissioning temples and wall paintings. Donors are shown in frequently making offerings or doing other good works. Seemingly secular scenes, you know, such as the palace scenes and the palace interiors, um, shown in many Jatakas, are integrally related to karma, since high rebirths, particularly as a king, um, are the result of excellent karma and hence of good moral conduct. Kings were also seen as bodhisattvas, 
linking, and this links back again to the religious part. So these scenes inspire people to the highest conduct, uh, to making donations, to showing what they can become. Um, and in a similar role, one finds the depictions, as Alex has mentioned, of colourful um, Indian trade textiles, the luxury trade textile imports from Bengal, Gujarat, and the Coromandel Coast, shown on the ceilings and edging the narrative scenes, um, which of course are also permanent offerings to the Buddha. So this is by no means an exhaustive list of the aspects of the subject covered. It's a really multifaceted and I think multi-dimensional study. Um, and <laughs> I'm making the same point um, um, as, as the last speaker about the excellence of references, bibliography and footnotes. Um, <laughs> really you have got a sort of encyclopedic um, uh, work just, just in, it, in themselves. I mean, I'm interested for another project that I'm doing in researching Zorgis or alchemists and the wiser or wizard come Marsida figures. You go to the right page, in Alex's book, you can find references for the last 20 years plus. <laughs> so, you know, it's an absolute joy for anyone who is interested in Burmese art and culture, you know, on, a, on, a, on, on many levels. Um, so to sum up, really, I think in terms of depth of historical, artistic, and religious scholarship and understanding and the clarity of exposition, Alex's book will surely become a benchmark uh, for this emergent subject for a considerable time to come. Thank you, Hugh, so much. So shame. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. John. Yeah. Well, uh, let me also um, uh, voice my thanks to Alex for writing this book and uh, <laughs> therefore giving us all the opportunity to, to read it. And, uh, it's, it's actually a book that literally from, you know, in the first few pages as you're kind of looking through the, the first chapter, you realise that, that actually this is a really intelligently crafted book. So chapter one kind of starts out as a kind of organic model of development in which she's, she's looking at moral standardisation and also exceptions to norms. But it's actually, you suddenly realise, what she's very cleverly doing is she's giving you a survey of all the material that she's going to study without giving you a survey, mm -hmm. or while building in um, this, uh, this organic model. So she effectively <coughs> argues that the gradual standardisation of these programmes in the 18th century lead then to a re very rapid variation by the 19th century, which effectively kind of dismantles or deconstructs the standardised vision. So, that's really cleverly done. She also works in, in the first chapter, a lot of the, the, uh, the, the kind of methodological issues and questions that she's going to pick up later on, particularly things about the agency of painters and patrons. She sort of drops that in. And so to an eye that is looking for that kind of thing, you're, oh, God, OK, you need to read on. It's, mm -hmm. That's cleverly done. <coughs> and I can reiterate um, uh, Sarah's comments, John's, that the levels of detail, you know, the clarity of the structure, the consistency of the argument, these are all uh, uh, to be praised. And uh, yeah, they are, they are. There's also <laughs> another thing, there's, there's a real um, honesty about the limits of what you can understand. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a part where Alex is, is accepts that our understanding or how we, the access that we can get to long 18th century, to term it that, codes of understanding and viewing, expertise. You know, what, did the, what was the expertise among audiences? We don't really know. And mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you just you state as much without trying any fancy footwork or anything. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, um, the other point, the, the, other, the last kind of general point I make, so I'm going to come on to talk about uh, narratology and iconology in a second. Um, is that it is it really is deeply embedded in the, the contemporary uh, critical discourses that are relevant 
uh, not just you know in the opening critical framework, but throughout. There's you know there is every almost you, you get a passage and then you'll suddenly you'll drop into uh, a, a kind of critical uh, discussion. So it's it's obvious that Alex is a very wide and deep reader. Um, as she travels back and forth on the coach from Oxford to the British Museum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as I'll come on to say in a minute, I think she's, in, in a number of places, critically, she's right on the money, um, especially with uh, one of the, the, the kind of um, themes or, or terms that she uses of unified spaces, and I'm going to come back and talk about that in a minute. So let me think, for, for, think aloud for a moment about uh, the narratology... Um, the narrato narratological analysis. Narratology, come to think of it, I remember reading it in the title of a, an essay in an edited volume that I was editing, and I thought, what on earth is that? That was in 2002, by the way. And anyway, now it's kind of settled in a little bit. Um, but you're, I, you are clearly embedded in that uh, critical literature and all of the various and multifarious modes of narrative uh, both historically and globally. And that underpins what then emerges, which is a very uh, sophisticated analysis of the visual arts of the long 18th, long 18th century Burmese temples. Uh, it also raises a, uh, a slight conundrum for me. Um, on page 12, for example, Alex states, narratology is the logical starting point. This is where she's discussing uh, her, her critical framework. Uh, narratology is the logical starting point, unquote, basically because the, more, the majority of the images that you're looking at are of the biography of the Buddha or Jatakas. Uh, I wonder, I pose that as a question to you. Can you unpack that a little more for us? I, I kind of also wonder what would all of these, you know, Mitchell and various of these other sort of people in, you know, and Hayden White and all these people, in, um, which are meticulously uh, uh, noted in your footnotes, what would they all make of this study, couched in their language, but situated in a, what for, to them must be a very alien place? And uh, so some people might wonder, you know, what, to what degree was it necessary for you to have situated this uh, regional study within that critical framework? Was it necessary to do that to, quote unquote, validate the material? I don't, you know, that's just a question I put there. To va validate the material culture that you're looking at. And just when you think um, Alex is kind of going down one methodological, critical route, she's, you know, she's, she's uh, fleet of foot. She does, for example, then bring in, you know, Renfrew and others on how uh, material culture is the materialization of the mind. So she slips into a more kind of anthropological set. And uh, so this interdisciplinary uh, facility is very impressive. Uh, the other point, the other general point on narratology is that obviously this book builds on the uh, edited volume, which, which Ashley mentioned, Rethinking Visual Narratives from Asia. Um, intercultural perspectives, or something, I can't remember the full title, <laughs> although I contributed an essay to it, in which uh, you, you, um, you know, narratology, you deal with narratology, not at all in a, in a dogmatic way, but regarding it more as a, a toolkit, or what you call, at one point, a fuzzy set. And that echoes the practice of some of the most imaginative theoretical thinkers in um, if, for example, in Chinese art history, you know, Jonathan Hay or someone like that would be, would be proud of that. Let me think for a moment about iconology. So actually, for a non-specialist like me, you know, the structure of a monograph is, becomes much, or you know, the sort of meta-narrative of it, becomes much more significant because the actual material is very unfamiliar to me. And so I was kind of very interested in the narrative of the visual narratives, as it were, where you're going over this... Um, this period that you're looking at, and very impressed, as others have been, by how you link it to so many things, to social discourses, to historical change, to liturgical development, um, all things that enable you to, dis to discern patterns and changes going on in, across the period that you're looking at, and in particular, highlighting shifts of emphasis 
in the way that the ensembles are put together and being able to interpret those. For example, the shift from uh, earlier having a, 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 a greater number of monoscenic uh, illustrations <coughs> to more extended, extended narrative modes later on, and also the way that you're, for example, able to unpack the way that uh, um, pre-enlightenment visual narratives tend to get a more monoscenic illustration, whereas uh, enlightenment and other, as you closer you get to enlightenment and enlightenment, they tend to get much more um, elaborate. And these are, uh, you know, the iconological analysis is very clever in that you link that to the way that there's a potential for viewers to change. Uh, you know, those, those, what's, what's in the past is in the past, but what's in, as it were, in the present is what activates or enables the viewer. Um, and you, so you do, as has been said, linking a lot of linking of the, these changes to oral and to telling, to presentation and preaching, um, linking the, the Jataka tale illustrations and the life of the Buddha tales to to these uh, these oral modes. Um, and, and maybe a couple other points on this before I'm going to come to some my final questions. There's one concept that I find very interesting in the monoscenic illustrations, and that's we're seeing them as enumeration. And uh, Alex links this very cleverly to knowledge categorization and transmission, how uh, the way that one can create a narrative in the present when it's activated or when it's actualized through audience participation. And also the way that that echoes contemporary monastic practices and the pedagogical structures of um, monastic practices at the time. And she neatly weaves this in to, to explore it as a, as a uh, partly as an issue of memory. Um, let me come on to the final two questions. One fairly short, one's a sort of bit longer. So the first one is about, I was kind of thinking, what ultimately, what are the drivers? What are the drivers of change? Because, I, I mean, in my reading, you, uh, you know, uh, early on you, you cite, for example, gel, and therefore art and agency becomes a, 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 a bit part, it's not a major part in it, because narratology is, is seemingly much more important. But I'm left wondering, you know, okay, it's objects that have agency, but it's patrons, monks, artists, and others who uh, you know, have a say in the creation and the formulation of it. Uh, which, who, how, why, among those, is it that's, that's really driving it? Um, and I mean, at one point you say that these stories, so you, you say what we have here are, quote, new renditions of old stories participating in contemporary cultural practices. So I kind of wonder, are they, are they just participating or are they actually also driving cultural practices? And from my reading of your work, it's actually very difficult to pinpoint where they sit on that uh, scale. So maybe that's uh, why you didn't, did, didn't take it on more. And the other uh, 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 point that I thought I'd just elaborate on a little more is the... Um, I think this is a critically edgy, the idea of unified spaces. And so this is the idea that, um, that you need to link everything in the temple space um, in order to understand it. So it's, you, you're viewing um, murals, you're viewing scale, you're viewing um, position of the uh, a Buddha figure as a phenomenological whole. Um, so murals have various registers, as Alex explained. They are, those relate to the placement of the Buddha figure in the middle. And there's a particular scale and function which enables, might enable uh, chanting or circumambulation. Um, these are uh, all, in other words, they're ensembles that create spaces of, uh, as you say, devotion, memorialization, ritual enact enactment, etc. Now, I know on the cover, it says that it's a study of wall paintings. 
right? But what I left, was left wondering is, can you not just take this one little step further and go outside the building to think about the architectural and the, the sort of land planning issues? So, it, and the, the sort of precincts in which these, these um, temples sit. So, for example, what, was, what is the relationship between the murals inside and indeed the architectural depictions within the murals mm -hmm. to the buildings themselves and to the, where those buildings sit in relation to the people, the society, who are uh, the patrons of the buildings and who are presumably coming to, to use it. And I, I, I thought this, was, this, this might... Uh, you know, this might be quite an interesting uh, uh, area to, to look it into further. Um, that, I mean, there are various other things I might say, but I think I will just draw it to a close there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's quite, quite, quite a few questions to answer. Um, I'm happy to say I feel that I can answer all of them. So, so. <laughs> um, so unpack uh, narratives as a logical starting point, and you know what would Mitchell and White make of of, of this approach? Um, I, I started I started basically looking at narratives um, because one of the when I first went to Burma, obviously I didn't know what the paintings were about, so I took just lots and lots of pictures, and John O'Kell very kindly helped me translate um, the captions, and I slowly figured out what what these images were. And I mean, they were all, they were stories. I mean, the writing is clearly a caption. Um, these were all stories. At the time that I was doing my PhD, I didn't really look at the peripheral material, which obviously I've changed in, in the book. Um, and so I thought, well, if they're all stories, then I need to start by looking at, at narrative theory. Um, and so, but then as of course, as I got more into it, and of course I started looking more at, at Buddhist uh, studies, then you see, obviously, how narratives are so essential um, to um, transmission of Buddhist concepts. I mean, that's, I mean, the Buddha used narratives to teach um, his major concepts. And actually, of the three um, um, baskets of the you know, Tripitaka, the first two, the Sutta Pitaka and the Vinaya Pitaka, are basically narratives. And it's only in the third one that you get onto these lists and enumeration um, so intensively. And that it's again structured very much for sort of memory and 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 um, and, uh, uh, um, and enumeration in order to be able to uh, uh, to re remember it easily. Um, so I think that um, that narrative really is it really has to be where you, where you start. Not only is it visually a narrative, but then culturally it's coming out of very much a narrative tradition as well. So in Burma. Um, at this time, there were um, people who went around and presented Jataka plays. You have people preaching uh, Jataka stories, not only uh, monks, but also lay people. Um, so all these features, narrative is such an essential component. I think it, it, it seemed just obvious to me that, that I had to start there. Um, so that's what I did. What would Mitchell and White make of it? Um, well, I think. This is part, and part of what I've been trying to do, and part of what I tried to make come across in, in my talk here was that we have really considered images to be secondary. Um, our history gets, you know, knocked on frequently, um, and words and texts are are everything. And I really think that um, by looking at this material, you see how the two work together. Um, you've done, of course, a lot of work on on texts and and images as well, and of course, Sarah um, has too. And I think that, um, and then with this work I'm doing on the, the posters, I mean, you can really see that there's so many ways in which words and images interact, and that images actually function on their own. They're not necessarily dependent on words. They can be dependent on words, but it's not um, a, a necessity. And the result is, is that you end up with you need a, a larger, a more holistic um, exploration of the topic, and I think Mitchell and White you know, very much look at texts. Um, so I'm not sure that they would be that interested, but I think if we can persevere in presenting this material and demonstrating how images are significant, that then, um, I don't know, maybe get people to come around. So I hope that answers your, 
your initial question. Um, and then your question about what are the drivers of change? Yeah, there, I mean, there were so many drivers of change, um, and that was hard to, um, to integrate in a, in, a, in a clear fashion in the book. Um, obviously, the patrons are drivers. Obviously, what's happening socially um, um, are drivers. Obviously, the monks are drivers. The monks supervised the paintings. The patrons came. They wanted a ritually efficacious uh, building. And so they're going to want to um, you know, maintain that, the standardized form. Um, but then you have all these, these outside inputs. You have the Indian um, trade textiles, which were luxury goods. You have um, people who were being relocated to the heartland of Burma, because um, Burma, of course, was a very um, aggressive colonial power in the region, um, bringing back people from the Shan states, bringing back people from northern Thailand, from Laos, from Manipur, um, and, of course, from um, Rakhine state. So then, of course, you. But, in bringing all these people back into the central heartland and relocating them and integrating them in. Um, the Portuguese, of course, were brought back um, um, in the early 17th century up to the heartland. And so you end up with all these ideas. But one of the things that really struck me about the paintings is that um, as time progressed, and I talked about this briefly, where you had all these outside ideas coming in. You had a, a very significant stylistic change. Um, you have um, new types of imagery brought in, but that structure, is really constant over this long 18th century, this mm -hmm. more than 150 year period. And I think it's because you have this stable structure which relates very strongly um, to fundamental religious concepts. And because you've got that, you can bring in all this new stuff. And the new stuff is, is of interest and can be explored because it doesn't fundamentally alter what's actually going on um, in, in the paintings. So in terms of the, the drivers of change, you have all that stuff which is driving change at one level, but not at, a, at another level. Um, and of course, the patrons want to be up to date. They want to show off their, their, their wealth and status. Um, the monks were, as I said, were part of this larger um, secondary monastic network and um, with very strong links. And you can see that. There are certain sort of bodies of, of, of styles. So you get a, few, a particular type of style that will be in a few villages. And then you have a different style in other villages. But then you also have styles um, that are <coughs> trans-regional and, and or you know, um, in, in that central area. And so I think clearly there were artists that were also moving around, groups of artists that were moving around. Um, and then they, of course, would circulate um, I ideas. And, um, but the paintings themselves then also are, are drivers. You know, these, they're trying to get people, they're, 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 they're a carrot um, to what you're going to get if you behave in, in an appropriate way. You're going to have a life where you have access to luxury textiles. You are going to have a life where you have access to the goods and material benefits that a, a king would have, a, a beautiful you know, palace to, to live in and so forth. So I think there, there's, there's so many things that are, that are pushing it. Um, and then in terms of the unified spaces, and going outside the building, yes. I mean, I think that's a really interesting question, and thank you. Um, the murals, um, the, the buildings in which the murals are housed, again, tend to be very similar. So they tend to be, as I said, the, a, sm a central, usually a square central chamber, occasionally with a, a small circumambulatory corridor, mm, and then uh, with a, sup a stupa superstructure. Um, this becomes a very typical format. Um, again, in, in, from the 17th century onwards. And what you see in, with these buildings is they're clustered together in groups. So you'll go to a village, Yezajo or a Ne or a Min, and you'll have a cluster of these buildings. Um, and they all tend to be near monasteries. So, and what I think is actually happening in terms of um, uh, looking at them outside is that you tend to get larger clusters in centers that were particularly famous as secondary, uh, um, as secondary monastic centers. So obviously, you know, oh, you know, a famous monk is there, or a famous group of monks are there. Therefore, we want to donate there because um, that is, uh, um, you know, that's going to get us the most merit. Um, so that's you end up with these these sites uh, scattered across the landscape, and they kind of trace that 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 monastic network. Um, as a whole. Um, in terms of land planning, again, they tend to be in um, specific compounds next to uh, a, a monastery. 
And again, as I said, I think it really very much has to do with um, prestige and, and, and the names of the monks there. And I know there's another work coming out on late um, Burmese wall paintings that involves the uh, Buddhism scholar, Alexei Kirichenko. And I think that will probably um, help us understand a bit better because Alexei's gone into all these um, monastic libraries and he can read um, um, these, the old Burmese and uh, he, he's just an amazing linguistic and Buddhist scholar. So he may be able to link some of these sites more specifically to particular monks you know, in a way that I haven't and I haven't done. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind of how I, how I see it, that it, it ties in very much with you know, what people are trying to achieve and what you find, what sites, you know, important sites you find, you find where. Um, I don't think, if you're talking more specifically about the immediate landscape, I don't think there is that. Um, they are a little bit too random to be that. Um, and it may have to do with, again, um, the possibility of purchasing a, a piece of land. And again, that's not something I've, I've gone into. Sorry. I, I, I noticed the future tense coming in a lot. Well, we're talking about the luxuries and uh, the mm -hmm. beautiful and heaven realms and things. And I wondered the extent to which the temples would be perceived as sort of almost in the present tense, provided for that luxury. I mean, were they seen as very um, pleasant places to go to? Because that's what strikes me when I, I go to them. I just think, oh, gosh, isn't this wonderful? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I the sense of some misery sort of uh, uh, contract in fact I, I don't actually I know this is often said in, in, in books about the, the, the day rooms and cosmologies but I actually wondered how much they're supposed to be sort of almost there at the moment it's kind of uh, a pleasant environment I think so. I mean, certainly in the inscriptions that most of the inscriptions were written in the doorways, so they've they've mm. gone. But the few that we've got, I mean, they definitely are looking to the future. Um, mm. But of course, it's going to provide you with a lot of social capital now. Um, you know, it's going to provide you with social status um, now. And um, but I'm not sure how much they were used beyond. Um, the initial donation. Oftentimes when you make an offering, I mean, then that's done. It's, it's generated the merit for you. In a sense, it's finished. And there are some records that I came across um, that basically said, you know, within sort of a generation or two, these buildings were derelict already. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that they were a donation. Yes, they may be used. They're swept for a while and flowers put in. But after a while, yeah. then it's just, it's let slide. You know, maybe his family's moved away or you've made a new offering. Um, it's, uh, I think they really are, in a sense, of the, the present, yeah. Um, yeah. even though while looking towards the future. I've got a question. Yes. Um, art historians like Styles, and you mentioned four particular main styles, and you analyze them. But I didn't get a, a sort of clear sense of, I mean, maybe there isn't a sense of how they could be linked to particular monk bodies or times. I, Perhaps I've missed something, but I couldn't get that. No, I mean, the thing is, is with the styles is they, they, they all overlap um, mm, with each of other. Of them, yeah. um, and again, some of them seem to be region, re, uh, you know, in a specific area, group, a group of villages. Others seem to be more pan-regional. Um, and we don't have that information. We don't ha have information about the artists. And so then I think it's very difficult to say um, how, how it's basically impossible to answer your question. Um, the only style that we have sort of clear connections with is um, the one that emerges after um, the Burmese sacked Ayutthaya in 1767 and brought all these artists back. You start to see st Thai stylistic elements in the paintings. You start seeing uh, gold leaf in the paintings. You start seeing the use of this particular type of turquoise blue. Um, and so then we, and because those are elements that are in Thai paintings, we can mm. make that connection. Um, but otherwise, we can't be more specific mm. than yeah. that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, mm. And it, oftentimes, the, the, the paintings were done um, by teams. Um, when they describe paintings in the royal order, the, the production of paintings in the royal orders, they always talk about the um, 500 painters. Obviously, you're not going to have five, 
100 painters working on a temple that's three meters square. Um, and this is a kind of a typical number that's used in, in, in Buddhism. And, um, and so I think it's, it's much more that, but obviously, I mean, it's done very specifically by groups of artists. Um, and I think they traveled around, but other than that, I can't say more. Sorry, Long just taking, taking notes, taking notes. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all very much. I think um, we've spoken a lot, and now it's your turn. Hi. I'm really interested in the temporality of these cosmological spaces. As you noted, they kind of collapse the Jataka tales with the, the contemporaneous Burmese time. Um, and I was wondering, one, if the presence is tied to the, to the, or the temporality is tied to the presence of the Buddha, the past Buddha, the present Buddha in the space, the future Buddha, Maitreya. But also, what are the limits of these two distinct times of religious versus sec secular time um, in this space? I don't know if this goes back to this idea of unified space, because there seems to be kind of a blurring of lines of time and space through the narratives that you've discussed. Well, they're, I mean, I would say that they're not, that the past has been made present. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would think that, I mean, I would say that you've got the Buddhas of the past, the 28 Buddhas of the past, I mean, they're very much there to affirm um, the worthiness of Gautama Buddha. That's, that's their role. Um, the life of the Buddha, of course, shows you how he got to where he is, but it's, again, it's set in contemporary times. So I think they're less concerned about, um, they're not trying to record a history as much as present, again, um, narratives to explain why the Buddha became enlightened, but also to enable um, the practitioners, the local practitioners, to be part of his community. The, there's a whole concept of, um, uh, that's been developed by a man named Jonathan Walters of communal karma, that basically you pass through your various rebirths um, um, with the people that you're with now, so you know your spouse or your family now. Um, is actually going to be your spouse and your family in your next life as well. Hopefully, the, hopefully that's <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> but so again, the community that you're in will be will be your community in the next in the next life. So I think it's not they're not worried about the past. They're looking at making a community, indicating how the Buddha is part of their current community, and then of course um, will be part of their they'll be part of that community in the future and therefore will be able to become enlightened or become awakened in the future, in the future after having passed through various rebirths. So it's a, it's a, it's a collapsing of time. Okay. So, yes? Thank you. I look forward to reading the book. Oh. Um, am I correct in supposing that the narratives are moving clockwise? Uh, yes. And then I think one of the images you showed us, everyone was moving in a left hand direction. Yes. So, so no. Does each sort of frame link into the next one? And, and then following from that, you refer to it as a spiral, but does that imply, is it, is it more like rings on top of each other, or does it actually move from one layer into the next layer? Um, no, it, it actually, yes, it is probably a bit more like rings, as you say. Um, yes, and there was one image where it goes the other way. Um, but um, except for that temple, there, there are always exceptions. There are always exceptions. Um, I showed the wrong image. Yes, obviously. No, it's, it's a very nice painting, so I showed it. Um, but most of them do go um, clockwise. There is the odd occasion when it moves counterclockwise, but the, um, uh, you still have most of the stories, even if some of them go the wrong way, most of the stories are still going clockwise. And the whole um, thing still spirals or you know um, piles up. Does um, it go anti-clockwise for some narrative re reasons? Because can you see why it's suddenly going the way? To be honest, I haven't I haven't spent time looking at that particular temple and why it goes the other way. Um, so I can't answer your question. Um, but I think sometimes it has to do with um, um, the arrangement of space. So again, it's not they're not so worried about temporal issues, but they're worried about spatial issues. So if it linked, and this is, I'd have to go back and look at the temple, if it linked well with the end of the previous story, then they would, they would reverse it. So for example, in some narratives you get, you have your strip, it is mostly going clockwise, but then some of the scenes will all be jumbled up inside the narrative. And that again is where they conflate space. So you've got, for example, if you have a large uh, palace scene, sometimes they'll put all the palace scenes there. Um, before proceeding with the rest of the story on. So, I mean, I suspect it has something to do with that as opposed to um, um, anything religious or ritual. 
um, that it's kind of a, a, a practical use of space. Um, so and they did like to emphasize um, very particular types of scenes. So um, scenes of pomp and circumstance. Um, so palace scenes are very large. Anytime you have a kind of a procession, it's always very large. I mean, there's some temples where you'll have the narrative squished into say about 40% of the space and the other 60% is palaces and, and processions. Um, so they tend to really bring those aspects out. And again, I argue that, that it has to do with um, you know, the carrot. You know, this is what you're going to have in future lives if you participate in, in this type of, of ritual behavior. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Sorry. Uh, I noticed in the beginning when you showed the photos of the inside of one of the shrines, it's actually quite dark in there, and the, mm -hmm. the structure seems like more quite a, to go quite a, a couple of meters up, I guess, at least three meters, I would say. I don't know how close. But I mean, in that case, you wouldn't, as a worshiper, it'd be very difficult to see uh, the paintings that are well above your head. It'd be too dark, and you're too far away. So, is there a limit to uh, at least from the point of the view of the, the kind of day-to-day -day worshiper in these shrines, the limit to understanding of narratology. That is there an iconic function that that these paintings are more playing for everyday worshippers? And you know, as art historians, I'm obviously obsessed with every detail that meticulously done. But is there a limit? I mean, as from from an ordinary worshiper's point of view, is it really an iconic function to those images and to yeah, I think actually the, the answer to the question is, is that wasn't a very good picture. <laughs> and I think it's probably more my photography than anything else because actually the, the buildings are being only three meters square and probably not more than, than three meters high. They really aren't, um, they aren't actually as dark. Sorry, that was, that was always at the beginning. Um, there, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think that's mostly the angle of my picture because you can, I, oh yeah, no, you can't see it at all up there. No, in the picture you can actually see the ceiling and you can see the designs on the ceiling. I'm sorry, but that wasn't a very good image to choose. Um, but so, what's the difference between these later temples and the earlier ones? The early ones were very large and they were extremely dark, the buildings inside, and so then you couldn't actually see the narratives. So the narratives clearly weren't there for the worshiper or the, the devotee, they were obviously there in order to enhance the sanctity of the building and to perform other functions. Um, here, I, I would say that they really are part, um, you know, they're very clearly um, set in contemporary times and you can actually see the imagery um, so that um, it does make you feel enfolded and enclosed. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Yes. So the, the donatory inscription, so basically there is a single uh, donor for the entire structure building the statues or paintings, is that right? Yeah, yeah, or a family. So how do they refer to it? I give this what to the sasana? What, 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 is the, what is the term that's used to refer to this structure or the, the gift itself? Oh, what term do they Does use? Say the wasp? I mean, you know, no, they'll say, they'll, they'll say temple. Destroyed. They'll say peya. They'll say peya. Oh. They'll say the, the temple. And then sometimes they'll, and occasionally we so have. Peya is I use, only used for the word temple. No, Pea is a Buddha image. It's it's a oh, general right. term it's for a thing that is sacred. Yeah. Oh, so it's not really specific. No, because there's the, no specific term for giving this. Mm -mm. No, no, um, but okay, we have occasionally been lucky enough to have the person explain why they had it painted, and so they were talking very specifically about beautifying the space um, as it uh, to honor the Buddha. Um, but again, as a, the, these are usually quite scrappy. Oh, um, God, do they have a specific term, or it just says Pea? But gone, I don't know. Um, I would have to go back and look at, at early donative inscriptions. Um, I don't know if they're using it. John, do you know if they're using paya at, by the, in the Bagan period? Same question. The, the, are they using the word paya to refer to temples and Buddha images during the Bagan period? Like when they make donations and inscriptions, what, how, what is the, how specific are they in terms of what is being donated? They say the Buddhist statue, they say, or, or something very general, where they say this shrine, this, this vihara, what is the. The, the, the ones I remember, um, you generally give a list. They say, uh, I built this temple and it cost so much, and I dedicated these slaves, and 
Yeah. I dedicated these pews and uh, I built a wall around the temple and I dedicated the Buddha image. Um, and they use uh, words like goo for a temple. The goo, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes, of course. They also use it during the Bagan period. Okay, yeah. So. Now, what you get by the later uh, time period, 17th and 19th century, is um, they don't list so much what they've built as to what they, they list a great deal of what they want to get. Um, <laughs> so it's, I want a beautiful voice, and you know, I want to be free from danger, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so it's a shift in, it's a shift from an offering to a <laughs> desire. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, are there any connections between the wall paintings and landscape paintings from the same period? Yeah, yeah. And I have I discuss the relationship between um, wall paintings and manuscripts. Basically they follow a manuscript format. So if you um, had the you the Manuscripts tend to be folded concertina style, or at least the illustrated ones. And so if you stretch them out, it would basically look like a strip of, of the wall painting. So I argue, actually, that the paintings, in addition to functioning overall as a, as, a, as a textile pattern, they also look like a whole bunch of manuscripts that have been pulled open and, and hung around the walls. So definitely. So I mean, there, there's many layers of, of giving um, in these images. Um, not only do you see images of giving, but then, of course, they mimic manuscripts and they mimic um, luxury trade textiles. So. Yeah, I mean, that's a, one of the points I, I didn't make it, but it seems to me that that's a, one of the ways that they become real mm -hmm. because they, they echo actual practices of yeah. daily life in, yeah. in multiple different ways, and that's one of them. Yeah, yeah, and also, you're, I mean, you're, you're bringing in all this material the everyday materials or, or materials that you would use, um, you know, to make offerings as well. So I mean, it's actually, it, as you say, it makes them real. It makes them material. Mm -hmm. Well, the book is available for sale. You will all be happy to know. <laughs> Next door, in, well, in B104, we have a reception, and uh, we do have, I think, six copies of the book that are available. Uh, for a discount this evening. Mm -hmm. So uh, speak to Alex. And otherwise, it's also, uh, it will be available at the moment for order uh, through the SOAS bookshop downstairs. And uh, I think we'll, we'll stop there. Thank you all very much for coming. And thank you to Alex and to our speakers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.